come out of the storm and rest with us. Put your, aside your cloak of troubles and ease your mind. The cloak will surely be there later, waiting to be reclaimed. This is a place of healing and renewal. Our business here, though through an ever-changing panorama of words, music, thoughts, and feelings, and sometimes challenges, is reminding us of the greatness of the human spirit, a spirit capable at every moment of mo moving toward the good one step at a time. Welcome everyone to the service from all over the world. Welcome our guest, Reverend Dr. Josh Schneider, who serves the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Hudson Valley, north of New York City. He previously served congregations in San Antonio, Texas, Wilmington, Delaware, and Omaha, Nebraska. He is a graduate of Meadville Lombard Theological School and the University of Michigan. He has two sons, Thomas and Matthew. He has been a practicing Buddhist in addition to a Unitarian Universalist for over 25 years. So we have um, a few announcements today. Um, the first one is um, there is a renewing faith worship theme for March. Um, so please, um, on Wednesday, February 9th at 7 p.m., there will be um, a meeting to discuss uh, that worship theme. Again, it's renewing faith uh, for the month of March. Um, so you're invited to come help plan um, on Wednesday, February 9th at 7 p.m. Um, secondly, uh, join Reverend Joseph and Ryan Strickler for a discussion called Exploring Divinity in a Brewery. So this discussion on divinity and humanity as it relates to Christ during this Lenten season will take place in a large uh, safe space, hopefully at Birdfish Brewery on Tuesday um, at 7 p.m. Uh, February 15th. Just making sure I've got these details right. Okay, so this is uh, again, Tuesday, February 15th at 7 p.m. at Birdfish Brewery. And also our own Jim Rogers has an art show at Judith Ray Solomon Gallery at YSU entitled This, That, and Other the way I see it. It is open until February 25th, so please go check it out. Okay, so um, for my chalice lighting today, I was thinking about this month's theme, widening the circle, and an image came to mind that I've seen on social media now and again. Um, it has two circles. The small circle has an arrow pointing to it labeled your comfort zone, and then there's a much larger circle labeled where the magic happens. I don't know if you've seen this image around, um, but it seems to me if you stay in the small area of your comfort zone, you won't then get to experience all of the amazing things that happen with stretching yourself a bit further that might feel comfortable or familiar. So it's a very motivational image for sure, but it made me think about our um, theme this month and kind of some thoughts came to mind one actually was beyond the idea of moving um, from your little safe circle to this big scary circle. If we think of widening the circle, it's interesting to contemplate, well, what if we stayed in our little circles of our lives, whether that's you know, our own habits, behaviors, uh, things that make us feel safe and comfortable and good, we could actually take that little circle and widen it. Um, and so then, we could actually invite more of the unknown towards us rather than taking a big leap kind of outside of ourselves to jump into the unknown to realize our fullest potential. So it's like the unfamiliar slowly becomes familiar and um, new behaviors or habits or goals become as comfortable as old friends. So by widening the circle, we could stay rooted in ourselves and our grounding while stretching our arms out the new and unexpected. And maybe that's where the magic happens. So we light this chalice today in the spirit of widening the circle in our lives and in our community.
Furry Logic, A Guide to Life's Little Challenges by Jane Seabrook. Getting Up in the Morning. Smile the first thing in the morning. Get it over with. Back should never be faced too early in the morning. I would be unstoppable if I could just get started. Facing the day. I try to take one day at a time, but sometimes several days attack me at once. Life is full of challenge and frustration, but sooner or later you'll find the hairstyle you like. Always remember, you are unique. Just like everyone else. Be yourself. Nobody is better qualified. I never made who's who, but I am featured in what's that. Eating right. Forget health food. I'm in an age where I need all the preservatives I can get. Life is short. Have another piece of chocolate. I didn't claw my way to the top of the food chain to eat roughage. I want it all, and I want it delivered. Work, work, work. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs, it's quite possible you haven't grasped the situation. All power corrupts. Absolute power is kind of neat. Don't rush me. I'll make the wrong decision when I'm good and ready. When you're in it up to your ears, it pays to keep your mouth shut. No one is listening until you make a mistake. If at first you don't succeed, try not to look too astonished. If at first you don't succeed, swallow all evidence that you tried. No day is so bad that it can't be fixed with a nap. Parenting. The quickest way for a parent to get a child's attention is to sit down and look comfortable. There are few things more satisfying than seeing your children have teenagers of their own. You can't stay young forever, but you can be immature for the rest of your life. Relationships. If you don't agree with me, it means you haven't been listening. Don't be afraid. I'm right behind you, using you as a shield. Never go to bed mad. Stay up and fight. Your secrets are safe with me and all my friends. As you get older, your secrets are safe with your friends because they can't remember them either. If you leave me, can I come too? It's been lovely, but I have to scream now.
So please join me in reciting the covenant of this church. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. Each month we donate all loose cash and unmarked checks put in the offering plate to a nonprofit organization whose mission and actions are consistent with the UU principles and the mission of UUYO. For the month of February, that organization is the Academy for Urban Scholars High School in Youngstown. The mission of the Academy of Urban Scholars is to produce work ready, college ready, caring, articulate, critical thinkers, and lifelong learners who are socially responsible, resilient, and productive citizens in an increasingly diverse global community and economy that leads to graduation. We will now receive the offering that supports the life of Youngstown, the Mahoning Valley, and our wider world. I invite you at this time to join in the spirit of meditation. Uh, you may want to do that any way you feel comfortable, maybe sitting up a bit straighter in your chair, putting your feet flat on the floor to ground yourself to the earth. Close your eyes if you wish to, or leave them just a little bit open. And slowly take in a deep breath and gently release it releasing all of the stress of the week. This is entitled The Silence of Waiting by Todd Brayfogel. What does it mean to listen to the sound of silence? Without the noise of automobiles and airplanes, we hear much more. Silence becomes loud, or rather our perceptions become finer. When it is quiet, we hear more. Quiet is a time of waiting, and waiting is difficult. Rudolf Otto describes the inward concentration and detachment of waiting as a submergence. The submergence of what into what? What do you do to still yourself in waiting? What do you hear? What are you called to write as the pencil of the unearthly writer? Let us be together for a few moments of silence. Amen. Our reading today is from the author and Zen master Brad Werner, who is something of a local uh, 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 teacher, from what I understand. Uh, Reverend Joseph told me he's from Kent, so uh, a, a local guy. Um, this is from one of his books, Hardcore Zen. It is entitled A Walk Along the Sinagawa River. One day in early autumn, I was, walk I walk I was walking to work. And as I got to a little bridge that crossed over to a very narrow part of the Senegawa River, I suddenly became open to everything in the universe throughout all time. I had crossed that bridge every day for years. It was my customary route to go to work. I would take the Odaku train from Shinjuku Station to Seijo Gakin Station, get off there, walk by the KFC with the plastic statue of Colonel Sanders out front, and go down the street, make a turn at the river, walk along the river to the bridge and cross over. Then I'd walk behind Toho Studios where they made the Godzilla films. 
Sometimes I'd be lucky enough when I peeked in to see them actually filming a guy in a Godzilla suit walking around in a miniature, uh, in a miniature uh, train. Hmm, goodness, hold on. My document didn't work here. Let me try that again. Oh, goodness, our reading today has somehow disappeared on us. Let me give that another shot. Sorry. Oh my. Uh, and so Brad Werner was walking along this bridge and he experiences a tremendous experience of being connected to everything. Um, and at once he is uh, together with all things. And it is an amazing experience to behold. Unfortunately, my document isn't coming up. So um, let us go on to uh, our special music. I apologize. I cannot get that. Reverend so Josh, I actually have the reading. Um, I oh, emailed it to me. Do you want me to send it to you? Or? No, I just, I just got it back. I'm sorry. Oh, goody. OK. <laughs> The day I met here, excuse me, <laughs> let me start that again. Um, little technical issue there on my end. One autumn day, I was walking to work, and as I got to a little bridge that crossed over a narrow part of the Senegata River, I suddenly became open to everything in the universe throughout all of time. I had crossed that bridge every day for years. It was my customary route to work, and I would take the Odaku train from Shinjuku and get off at the Gakuin Mai station. Walk past the KFC with the plastic statue of Colonel Sanders out front and take a, a turn at the river to walk along the river to the bridge and cross over. Then I'd walk behind Toho Studios where they made the Godzilla films. Sometimes I'd be lucky enough when I peeked in to see them actually filming a guy in a Godzilla suit walking around in a miniature Pacific Ocean complete with tiny battleships. And after that, I'd wind my way back through the uh, Zubaria Productions the company that I worked for. The day I met God was completely normal, probably a Tuesday or some other nondescript weekday. One of the oddest things about what happened is that I cannot place a date on it. I suspect it was the late 1990s. My sense of time was knocked for a loop so hard that it's impossible for me to even construct events enough to figure out what the heck year it was any more accurately than that, let alone the day. That's very odd, even to me. The reason I cannot fix a date on it is that the incident occurred outside of time. I know that sounds bizarre, but this was something uh, my teacher had told me about, so-called enlightenment experiences. We usually think that everything happens at a specific point in time. Well, this didn't, and maybe nothing really does, but we'll leave that aside for now. And although this happened to me, Brad, in a city called Tokyo on a certain day of the week in a specific year, the incident did not occur on a specific day in a specific location to anyone in particular. It occurred throughout time and everywhere in the universe. It did not happen only to me. It happened just as much to you. To say that it was an incident that happened does not do it justice. It was, a, it was not an isolated event. It was and is the true condition of all things all the time. It was as much a living, breathing entity as you or I, maybe even more so. It wasn't merely an incident that happened, it was also a presence that was, is, and always will be there. It underlies everything. It's the very basis of all experience. It was more me than I could ever be, but it was not me at all. What I assumed was me, a guy named Brad Warner, who occupied a specific location and had a specific history, could do certain things and could not do other things, had a specific weight, height, and shoe size. This thing I call Brad Warner was, I saw, spread throughout the universe and throughout all of time. This was God, is God, will always be God. I cannot deny the experience any more than I could deny that I have a nose. It wasn't Brad Warner at all, and yet Brad Warner couldn't possibly exist except as part of it. Nor could it, God, exist apart from Brad Warner, or apart from you, for that matter. After it happened, there was no come down, no sense that anything special had happened. Yes, it was extraordinary by definition, and yet it was absolutely ordinary. 
It was the very root of all experience, both ordinary and extraordinary, both mundane and exciting, both now and outside of now. For a short while, I could not see only out of my own eyes, but also through the eyes of God looking at me. But it was not a short while. It was forever. And that is the most tawdry piece of enlightenment you've ever, I've ever written. I'm not making it up, mind you, it is all true. But even so, I have to warn you that you should not believe a word of it. You really shouldn't. One of the clear memories I have of growing up in the 1980s is of the Valley Girl fad. Now I realize that this revelation probably dates me. For those too young or too old to remember it, the Valley Girl talk, which I will not replicate for you, featured various colloquialisms such as rad or gnarly or oh my god. Now, growing up in a small town in Michigan, I was never sure which valley this was supposed to be from, but I remember many of my female classmates and <laughs> no small number of my male classmates imitating this form of speaking. Now, of course, by today's standards, it doesn't take Betty for Dan to tell you that this was a deeply sexist cultural stereotype about women in California. But back in the 80s, I guess we just kind of rolled with it. One of the lasting linguistic legacies of that fad that was in use, uh, and I will soon argue overuse, uh, was of the word awesome. Today, awesome is an adjective for nearly anything from sneakers to what you had for lunch. We use the word awesome to describe the most mundane and ordinary objects, when in point of fact, the word is intended to mean the very opposite. At the risk of really sounding like an old man who shoes away pesky kids uh, from my front lawn. The word awesome means literally something that has inspired awe. That is to say that such an object was good or excellent necessarily, but, but merely that it has an aura of unbelievability about it. It is literally incredible not to be believed. Something that has inspired awe within you has sort of blown your mind. You can't place it in any of your mental categories of your worldview. Not always a pleasant experience, nor a complimentary thing to say about someone or something. Rarely is it, in fact. Awe, in this literal sense of the word, is the response we have when we are in the presence of the holy. 
Something is holy when it is totally other or different from our mundane experience. That's part of what it means, at least. Awe is the feeling or emotion we experience in the presence of something larger than ourselves that encompasses more than just, uh, just us. The renowned scholar Rudolf Otto wrote a classic in the field of religious studies entitled The Idea of the Holy. And in it, he tried to put a name to this feeling of experiencing the holy other, holy with a W. And Otto described the holy using the Latin, of course. He said it is the mysterium tremendum et fascinans, a tremendous, fascinating mystery. Taking my cue from Rudolf Otto, I thought we would unpack, if you will, his three ideas about the holy, that it is mysterious, tremendous, and fascinating. Mysterious. Well, there's an old joke that notes that all theologians believe God is ineffable, and yet they go on effing. I didn't promise it was a good joke. My old teacher and mentor, Roy Rappaport, used to say that the holy is a mystery properly so-called, meaning that when we say the holy is a mystery, we don't mean that it's a mystery like a mystery novel or a, an episode of murder she wrote. In those cases, there's a detective like Jessica Fletcher who follows the clues to uncover the unknown murderer or criminal. And in the case of murder she wrote, she's always successful. Theologians are not detectives following the clues to find God. God, which is one of the many names that, we can, that can be given to the holy, is unknowable. It is impossible to know the mystery, which is another way of saying that religion is a combination of both the rational and the non-rational. Otto called that non-rational experience of, of religion the numinous. And the numinous are things or experiences that we can't fully explain or make sense of. That's because you feel the numinous more than you think it. Uh, sure, sometimes, maybe more than sometimes, religious folks have resorted to supernatural explanations to make sense of these feelings of the numinous. However, that's not inevitably the case. I remember one day in my youth, it was uh, the middle of winter, and I caught the flu or something. And at any rate, I was sick enough to have to stay home from school. And coincidentally, it happened to be the day that the space shuttle Challenger exploded on takeoff, killing everyone on board, including Christine McCullough, a teacher who was going to do lessons in outer space. And these were the days when there were only four or five channels. And I'm pretty sure my parents didn't even have a VCR yet. So there was nothing else to watch on TV, but a replay over and over of this explosion. I couldn't believe it had happened. Certainly my young mind couldn't. The pundits on TV couldn't believe that it had happened. And I would not see anything like it on TV again until the September 11 attacks many years later. That emotion, that feeling of, I know what I'm seeing, but I can't really process what I'm seeing. That is awe. We overuse the word awesome. Rarely, if ever, have tennis shoes ever invoked that feeling for me. But at the same time, it isn't a fully rational experience, is it? In fact, there's a, a disconnect between what I'm seeing and what I know to be the case. At one level, we know that at some point we'll be able to wrap our heads around the space shuttle blowing up, but at the time, it didn't seem so. How much more awe-inspiring, dare I say, awesome, would it be to encounter the holy? Indeed, our Unitarian ancestors had this very debate about the rational and the non-rational elements of religion. The Unitarians, who broke away from their Calvinist brothers and sisters, did so based on reason. Calvinism, despite being a tightly formulated and, and internally consistent theological system, was, was not what you would call rational in the purest sense. Reason led to heresy, the Calvinists claim, and heretics were to be excommunicated or burned. The early Unitarians, like Channing, argued that God made us use reason and therefore expects us to use reason. Ironically, it would only take one generation before that stance was challenged. Folks like Emerson and Parker and Thoreau were dis became disillusioned with a religion that sought mostly to be rational. Corpse cold was the term Emerson used to describe such a church. 
the transcendentalists were romantics in the truest sense. They found the holy not in well-reasoned syllogisms, but in nature, in poetry, in love. They yearned for an experience of something real. They wanted to feel the numinous. And if that meant living in a cabin by the shores of Walden Pond to feel it, then that's what they were going to do. Now, in, in addition to being mysterious, the holy is tremendous. That is to say, powerful and scary. There are tons of examples of God's power in the Bible. Every time I think of the power of the Old Testament God, I can't help thinking of the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, where the Nazis are destroyed by God's wrath. It's a powerful image that somehow could never be matched by any of my Sunday school lessons when I was growing up. But Steven Spielberg aside for the moment, the Bible underlines that God's power is something to be afraid of. Perhaps that's nowhere clearer than in the book of Job. The very first verse, there once was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. What follows is a debate between God and Satan over just how much does Job fear God, and so, much like trading places with Eddie Murray and Dan Aykroyd, God and Satan have a gentleman's agreement to destroy Job's life to see if he curses God. It's a long book and one of the longest in the Old Testament, but there's one key section kind of towards the end where Job recounts the power of God. This is Job 26, verses 7 through 14. He stretches out to the north over the void and hangs the earth upon nothing. He binds up the water in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not torn open by them. He covers the face of the full moon and spreads over it his cloud. He's described a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke. By his power, he stilled the seas. By his understanding, he struck down Rahab. By his wind, the heavens were made fair. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. There are indeed, these are indeed but the outskirts of his ways. And how small a whisper do we hear of him? But the thunder of his power, who can understand? That's quite an impressive resume. No wonder God points out how much Job fears him. Job, at least in this point in the story, has a pretty clear understanding of all the things God can do. Later on, God comes in the whirlwind to remind Job of all the things God has done and can do. And indeed, those words to Job in the whirlwind are the last words God ever speaks directly to anyone in the Old Testament. Those words are about God's majesty and why you should be afraid. Now, that's one example of the tremendous power of the holy. But remember, I said God's not the only way to understand the holy. I thought of non-theistic ways to experience the power and fear of the holy without resorting to God or some other form of theism. This was very important to Rudolf Otto. He felt his analysis of the holy applied to all religions, and he was known for traveling extensively in Asia to study Eastern faith. So the holy isn't just about finding and encountering God. There's a great episode of The Simpsons in which there's a Christian rock singer who befriends Homer and at the end of the episode, she says that she and her band are going to cross over from Christian rock and go mainstream. And Homer asks, well, won't that be hard? No, she says. All we have to do is change all the times we say Jesus and replace it with the word baby. I sympathize with this approach sometimes. What if we replace God with the word love? Love can be a powerful experience of the holy. Huey Lewis in the news famously sang, don't take money, don't take fame, don't need no credit card to ride this train, tougher than diamonds and stronger than steel. You won't feel it until you feel, you feel the power, feel the power of love. To fall in love, I mean really fall hard in love, is an experience of the holy. It is non-rational, that is for sure. That's part of what Otto meant by the numinous. You don't have control over who you fall in love with, nor do they. And that's the scary thing, because you're making yourself super vulnerable when you try to connect to another person at that deep level. So scary, in fact, that some of those who've been burned by that power of love don't seek it anymore. But that is a great tragedy, to cut oneself off from such a 
A tremendous mystery is the holy. Fortunately, the holy is also fascinating. Otto's third characteristic. Despite its mystery, despite its power, despite even the fear and awe we may experience in its presence, we are fascinated by it. It has an allure. The holy draws us like a moth to the proverbial flame. We want to know what that is like. We want to have an experience of the holy. In our reading this morning, Brad Warner recounts his experience of encountering the holy as he was walking to work along the streets of Tokyo. Brad is something of a Buddhist rebel and likes to call stories like the one we heard in our reading today enlightenment porn, experiences that are meant to tantalize and excite. But he says, you can't chase after someone else's experience. You have to have your own. Before I left Chicago, after graduating from seminary, a friend of mine got me tickets to see Sting and Tracy Chapman at the United Center. It was a kind of a combination birthday and graduation present. Probably the best concert I've ever been to. The, the United Center, which were, was this, which is where the Chicago Bulls play basketball, uh, was just packed to the rafters. There's something about rock and roll, isn't there? It's music that's not particularly in depth. It's not complex like Mozart or Wagner. The guitar riffs are not nearly as elaborate as Buddy Guy or B.B. King. But a couple of years back, there was a even a comedy routine of a band in Australia where they pointed out that there are dozens, if not hundreds, of pop songs hits throughout the decades, which are the same four chords repeated in the same order with just a different rhythm and speed. But the energy, the bass line, the hook that rock and roll brings grabs people at a primitive level and gives them that experience of the numinous. People have been attracted to it for generations and conservative Christians have feared it for that long, perhaps with good reason. Rock and roll is the fascinating element of the numinous. Rudolf Otto teaches us that there is a mystery to life that we cannot know, yet gives us energy and passion to live. We feel the hunger for it, even as we are scared and repulsed by it. For Unitarian Universalists, I think we need to acknowledge the holy without necessarily falling into the easy assumption of theism or flatten it out so much that we think a new sweater is awesome. Lots of things can be holy, or at least a, a gateway to the holy. Most of all, I think it's important to be open to the transformative power of the holy, to risk being transformed by its power, even if it is scary at times. Life can be scary even while it is worth living to the fullest. And like our fellow iconoclast Brad Warner, we need to be skeptical of it. We must not fully abandon reason lest we be overwhelmed or, co or coerced in dangerous ways. Now, yes, I know I have probably dated myself this morning. If you get the chance to go back and watch this sermon on YouTube, I suggest counting the number of references to the 1980s I've made in the last 17 minutes. So while I may be old in the eyes of some of our youth, I hope I never cease to search and perhaps find a window to the holy. May we all have an open heart to the numinous that shines forth throughout our lives. I love you. You're all awesome. Amen. Let us join together in a moment of prayer. Spirit of life and love, we come together this morning, not in person, but through the grace of technology. For we know that church is not defined by a building or a sanctuary, but by the interconnected bonds of affection that is the heart of the beloved community. And while snow has kept us at home for much of this week, may our time together be a spark that lights the warmth of friendship, the fire of commitment, and the energy to live our faith with passion and joy. Amen.
We extinguish this chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we keep in our hearts until we meet again. Our time in this place may have ended, but our connection to each other in this community remains. Together, may we walk the path of justice, speak words of love, live the selfless deed, trod gently upon the earth, and fill the world with compassion until we meet again. Blessed be.